This week, we're going to begin with Zeus and Hera. More specifically, we're going to begin first talking about the ages of man. We haven't really introduced humans into this mix yet. And then discuss the specifics of Zeus and Hera. So we get these ages of man from two different sources and they sort of tell two slightly different variations of the same story. We're gonna focus on Hesiod's telling of this story, which is that there are five ages of man. Ovid tells us a different story. He tells us that there are four ages leaving out the age of heroes in his list. But from Hesiod, we find out, um, like I said, that there are five ages of man, the golden age, the silver, bronze, the age of heroes, and the age of iron. So what is it that Hesiod tells us about the age of gold? So he says, golden was the race of speech endowed human beings, which the immortals who have their mansions on Olympus made first of all. They lived at the time of Kronos when he was king in the sky. Just like gods, they spent their lives with a spirit free from care, entirely apart from toil and distress. Worthless old age did not oppress them. They were always the same in their feet and hands and delighted in festivities, lacking in all evils. And they died as if overpowered by sleep. They had all good things. The grain giving field bore crops in its own accord, much um, an unstinting and they themselves willing, mild mannered, sharing out of the fruits of their labors together with many good things. Wealthy and sheep, dear most to the gods. But since the earth covered up this race by the plains of great Zeus, they were fine spirits upon the earth, guardians of mortal human beings. They watch over judgments and cruel deeds, clad in invisibility, walking everywhere upon the earth, givers of wealth and this kingly honor they receive. Very much a Garden of Eden-esque landscape in this golden um, age. We have Kronos as king, where humans basically live without having to work, um, much like the gods, essentially they live sort of a life of leisure where the earth produces of its own accord. The people in this age don't age, their death, they just would fall asleep and that's how they died. Um, like I said, they would get food here without labor. So very much we have this, like I said, very much a Garden of Eden-esque landscape here for these people of the golden age. Eventually this age of course would pass creating the, the necessity for <clears throat> this second race of people. So next they make the second race of silver who weren't like the golden race, the golden uh, men and women at all, right? either in body or in mind. Boys would be nurtured for a hundred years by their mother. And basically when they reached adolescence and they arrived in, at puberty, they would only live for a short time, suffering all sorts of pains and folly. But they could not restrain themselves from wicked out, outrage against each other nor are they willing to honor the immortals or to sacrifice upon the holy altars of the blessed ones. So 
So what happens? They don't. They refuse to give honor to the gods. Um, and then the earth, basically, the earth covers them the same way of the first generation. And it says, but all the same honor attends upon these as well. Um, so these people are far worse than that of the age of gold. Children essentially would, you would live for, I mean, what, they said a hundred years, right? So children would never leave their mother's side and they only lived a short time in adulthood. So most of their life was spent in adolescence. And it really is the refusal to worship the gods or offer sacrifices. That's one of the important things to remember about this second generation. Part of the reason that the gods create man are for the sacrifices they offer, for the homage that men pay the gods. So to the gods, what use is there for man if they don't do those things? And so Zeus hides them away, essentially destroying them. Next, he creates another generation, the generation of bronze. And I should mention, this is not to be confused with the Bronze Age, the historical Bronze Age. This is um, different. So another race of speech endowed humans, the third one of bronze, not similar to silver at all. And he makes these out of the ash trees. They cared only for the work, this is the only for the works of Ares and for acts of violence. So warfare. They didn't eat bread, um, but they had these strong hearted spirits of adamant which of course is what the sickle, um, Kronos' sickle is made out of this adamant. So they grew very strong and large. They made these weapons of bronze, houses of bronze. And what happened? They fought continuous warfare. They killed each other off and thus went to Hades um, because they were killing each other. This is a generation of terrible and mighty warriors, right? Who destroy themselves. And I think that that's interesting. So we've had three different ways for each to end where the first generation people just sort of died by sleep. The second generation people died essentially not that long after leaving their mother's sides. And the third, we have this generation great in warfare. So the age of heroes, of course, is one that we might consider probably going on around the same time as what the Iron Age would have been. So it's in this generation that we have people like Oedipus the Trojan War takes place during this period. Achilles, Heracles, Jason, a lot of the heroes we're gonna be talking about live during this generation. While they're great at warfare, they're also just. This generation is filled with demigods, right, with heroes who have parentage both of mortals and gods. People who live in this generation go to the Isle of the Blessed. We'll talk more about that later in the semester. They go to the Isle of the Blessed. This generation is honorable and glorious. A 
as we discuss the, the members, the, the heroes that live during this age, and we sort of talk about first their deeds, but also what happens to them when they die, we'll see that this is probably the generation most revered. I said they go to the Iron of the Blessed. Essentially, these heroes have these glorious, not only lives, but afterlives, most of them at least. Lastly, we have the Age of Iron. This is the age, the modern age. This age of iron, what? They're given difficult struggles, but good things still happen. People live to old age, but they also fight warfare. They don't respect their elders. They don't honor oaths. Jealousy and envy lives amongst men. Baleful pains will be left for mortal human beings and there will be no safeguard against evil. I love that ending. Again, it's, and what I think this, what's important and what this sort of gets at is we, if we look at, if we think about these generations as they sort of move along, you have the golden, this golden age of men where people are amazing and life is amazing and these wonderful things happen and there's no pain and there's no suffering. And then we go to the silver age where people essentially are not as good and so it brings pain and suffering into the world. Um, by the bronze generation, it's even worse and all there is is warfare and all these bad things. But then we have um, we have this age of heroes where we have valiant heroes that are um, just way better than the previous generation. Good things happen when they die. I mean, like positive things happen to their you know to them when they die, things like that. And then we move right immediately into a generation that's worse than the previous. And what's interesting is we see this idea of how generations sort of repeat, how generations repeat. And of course we see this, and what's interesting, and we're gonna get into this here with Zeus and Hera, is that Zeus represents this third generation where, but what's interesting is it's almost as if the gods work in reverse but we don't have that, we see, when we see that fourth generation, so we have the eight, and so, okay, let me try to be a little bit more clear what I'm trying to say. In the ages of man, we see these cycles, three generations, and then the fourth sort of starts the cycle over after they get progressively worse. <clears throat> right. This is something Machiavelli talks about in his Discourses on Livy, where he recognizes that in Roman history, it usually only takes three generations. So the first generation is usually really good, second generation a little bit worse, third generation is garbage. And you almost see this like reset. The Greeks sort of recognize this, this pattern, they see this pattern. So by the third generation, things are kind of garbage and you just reset. According to Ovid, this Iron Age ends with a flood, the flood. One of the few stories that we find in civilizations all over the ancient world is this idea of the world flooding. In 
this case, we have Lycaon who attempts to kill Zeus when he's in his human form. This is basically so the emblematic of this generation of iron where people are not good and just. And so Zeus decides to destroy this generation of iron with a flood, but he does preserve Deucalion and Pyrrha. All men, but Deucalion and Pyrrha are destroyed. And essentially, men is, the generation of men is reset after the flood. I said we have this this sort of flood narrative take place. I mean, in mythologies all over the world, and each civilization has a variation of this story. Details vary here and there. Names vary here and there, but for the most part, it's a similar story. All righty, so let's discuss Zeus. So here we have Homeric hymn number 23. Of Zeus, best and greatest of the gods, I will sing the wide shoulder sounding ruler, the one who brings to fulfillment, consults closely with Themis as she sits leaning against him. Be favorable, wide sounding son of Kronos, greatest and the most glorious. Zeus. The Roman name is Jupiter, the Lord and King of gods and men. He shares his rule with no one. He is the supreme leader. And although he is married to Hera, of course, we know he is quite promiscuous. And we're going to talk about several of these instances of Zeus is um, sleeping with immortal and mortal women, some by choice, some not by choice, or done through trickery. And the several offspring that are born of those moments. Zeus is also so powerful that he is able to bear Athena all by himself. And we'll talk about what happens. Hera attempts something similar. Um, and we'll talk about sort of what happens with that when we talk about her. So here we actually have a, ver a artist rendition of the temple of Jupiter, or uh, the temple of Zeus in Olympus which was one of the wonder, another wonder of the ancient world. The statue inside was made of gold and ivory. And we have descriptions of what this looks like. It actually looks similar to this statue that I had in the opening slide about Zeus. We have Zeus sitting on a throne holding Nike with an, in his right hand with an eagle perched next to him. So something similar to this. I should mention that this temple is destroyed. There aren't really remains of this temple.
one of the important things about Zeus is that we see Zeus fulfill lots of different roles. I mean, we've seen um, some of these in some of the quotes that I've used so far. It's like goat riding Zeus, um, several different epithets that Zeus has. Zeus actually, his list of epithets, we know a lot of them. I mean, but there could be several more that we just don't know. So some of them, like Zeus Seranius Sir, and Zeus Astrapeus, so Zeus of thunder and Zeus of lightning, Zeus Hypatus, the supreme Zeus. These in, not only inform us, but sort of reinforce what we know about Zeus as a god of thunder, of lightning, the supreme deity. Other of his epithets tell us other tell us other roles that Zeus had. In particular, ones that I want to draw your attention to: Zeus Xenios, Zeus of hospitality or strangers. Zeus Katharios of ritual, Zeus of ritual purification. <coughs> Zeus Eleutherius, Zeus of freedom. Zeus Polius, Zeus of the city state. Lots of different epithets. Zeus Xenios, and this is important, we're gonna talk about this. I, mean, I keep saying we're gonna talk about these things later in the semester, but there's this social practice of the Greeks called Xenia. So I'm X-E-N-I-A, that requires hosts to take in guests, feed them a meal, let them bathe, and stay protected in their home for at least a day. And Zeus protects this right. If you dishonor this right, if you harm that person in the middle of the night, it's Zeus Xenios who will strike you down with his lightning bolt. Particularly in the Trojan War cycle, we see this come up over and over and over again. Moments of bad Zinnia. And what are the ramifications for that? Zeus Catharius, um, this idea of, so catharsis sort of shows right here, um, but this idea of, ritual, of purification purification of things like miasma, which we'll talk about more about miasma later, but it's like a blood pollution essentially that happens after battle. And this, there's a necessity of purification. So just so you know, you don't need to know all, remember all of these epithets really the ones in bold are the ones I really want you to remember. So Xenios and Catharius, but I definitely want you to remember one through three also. I don't have them highlighted here, but um, definitely the, the first three. So Seranius, Estrapius, and Hypatus. So Thunder, Lightning, and the Supreme um, Zeus. We know that we that there is an attempt. So we talk about this idea of, um, of the, this generational sort of usurpation not really happening after Zeus and Zeus sort of ends it. But that's not really entirely true. There is an attempt by Hera, Poseidon, and Athena to overthrow Zeus. 
we're told about this in the Iliad. Where basically, um, What is it, it um, Achilles's mother comes to Zeus and reminds him how she helped him escape this. She tells him, remember, right? When the Olympians bound you up, Hera, Poseidon, Palestina. But you came, goddess. So this is, I should, maybe I should mention her. Um, Thetis is her name, and freed him from his bonds. And you had quickly called to High Olympus him of the hundred hands. Right? So one of this hundred handed ones, she called Briarius, but all men call him um, Aegeon. For he is mightier than his father, and he sat down by the side of the son of Kronos of Zeus, exalted his glory, and the blessed gods were seized with fear of him and did not bind Zeus. What's interesting about this, of course, is Athena being part of this attempted coup because she does represent this next generation and this attempt to overthrow. But after this, Zeus's essentially power is secured. There, this is really the only story that we have of any attempt to overthrow him. Unlike most of the movies you might watch today, Hades never attempts to overthrow Zeus, um, never attempts to usurp his power. In fact, he's not ever really upset about his position um, in the underworld. So no more attempts to usurp Zeus. I always wanted to put this up here. Here are the remains of the temple of Zeus in Athens. And this is not on the main Acropolis as we'll see um, with Athena later. But we do see, of course, a temple of Zeus in most major cities. We've seen the, the one in Olympus. And I want to sort of contrast it with this one where it's not quite on the scale but of course, Zeus is still worshiped here. Another very important aspect to discuss with Zeus is the several children that he has with several different goddesses and women. In many ways, this fills out the ranks of the Olympian deities, but it also gives us several of our heroes from the heroic generation of men. So in many ways, we, we're gonna be, we're just gonna begin with Hera. And much of our discussion of this sky god with fertility or motherly goddess, we've discussed and mentioned the idea of the Heros Gamos, which of course, Zeus and Hera represent. Together, they have three children. Um, Elithia, who's the goddess of childbirth, as Elethia, sorry, Elethia. Ares, the god of war. Of course, this is not strategic warfare, which we'll see that Athena is the goddess of, but uh, bloodshed and sort of this bloodlust in warfare. And lastly, Hebe, who is the wife of Heracles, later once Heracles is exalted. And so for the most part, if we think about Zeus as a sky god, this thunder and lightning. We also see Kronos as a sky god. We also have Uranos as a sky god. 
But what's interesting is in these previous generations where each of these sky gods with inside of their heroes gamas produce a, another sky god, Zeus and Hera do not. And I think it's interesting to think about that. Where these previous generations sort of perpetuate themselves through the, produ the production of a sort of perpetuated the next generation through this production of a sky god and a fertility and her mother god mother goddess. This generation does not. Hera does. Eletheia do Eletheia produce a goddess of childbirth? Yet we don't have, like I said, that sky god. Zeus does, of course, have um, Athena, who we'll talk about later, who in many ways does come to represent a very powerful deity. She can use Zeus's thunder and lightning, but she's not a sky god in the same way that Zeus is. Next, we have Leto who is the mother of Apollo and Artemis. In many ways, two of our most powerful Olympian deities. We'll discuss them more, but Leto, who's the daughter of Coeus and Phobe, is a Titan. And it's this union between a Titan and an Olympian, it really does. I mean, I, I can't emphasize sort of how powerful the Pollen Artemis are, particularly um, as these archery goddesses. We're going to see it later um, when essentially a mortal brags about her children being better than Apollo and Artemis and herself being better than Leto and the, the fury that Leto has in this discussion or in this bragging um, and the vengeance that Apollo and Artemis can have. And we'll see sort of Apollo and Artemis, their roles inside of the Trojan War, um, really was we'll just really see how brutal these two can be. While at the same time, Apollo, of course, is a god of healing. Next, we have Simile, whose son Dionysus, of course, will become the god of wine. These are the several deities produced. Um, Hera and Leto, of course, one being an Olympian, one being a Titan. Simile is a mortal woman. We're going to read a little about her and her family later in the semester when we talk about Dionysus. But the rest of these women are also mortal. So we have Leda, who has who Zeus, of course, turns himself into, so I should mention, with Simile, um, Zeus turns himself into um, a human. He um, sleeps with Simile, but he's not really, um, <clears throat> I mean, Simile <clears throat> sort of knows what's going on, if you will. Um, but Hera actually tricks Simile into asking Zeus for a favor to see him in his natural form. And Simile um, is burned and torched, basically um, burned to death um, and destroyed by this. So it's it's when him sort of like taking off his disguise that insta like leads to Simile's downfall. Um, but we'll see actually in some of these others um, bad things that of course happen because of Hera's wrath against them. I said next we have Leda, who when Zeus disguises himself as a swan sleeps with Leda, and she 
basically lays two eggs. The first of these eggs produces Helen and Polyduces or Pollux. These are the children of Zeus. And then Clytemnestra and Castor are born in the sec from the second egg. And these are the children of Tyndarius, who is Leda's actual husband. We'll see, of course, their roles. This is the Helen of the Trojan War and Clytemnestra, who um, will sort of factor into another later discussion. We'll see Castor and Pollux taking part in Jason's um, trip in the, the Argo. So all of these um, children take part in later um, myths. We have Alcmene, of course, whose son is Heracles. You see Hera in there. She, she's sort of the, the bane of Hera who continuously tries to ruin him and ruin his life. We have Danai, who Zeus turns himself into a golden shower, impregnates Danai, and she bears Perseus, who we'll see later, we'll talk about. I should mention most of these heroes we are going to talk about later. Um, Perseus and Danai is exiled, thrown in essentially into a casket and thrown into the sea. We have Europa, who produces Minos, who would become the king of the Cretans. And later we even are told that, well, we're told that Olympia recounts to Alexander the Great that Zeus disguised himself as a snake to sleep with her and that Zeus is actually his father. One important takeaway from all of these, of course, is that Hera does enact vengeance on most of these women. This can be somewhat problematic but also an unfortunately fairly indicative of the society that are telling these stories, where often men could have these relations with women outside of marriage. Men would often not suffer the repercussions of it, but the women would suffer those repercussions. Again, it's really in large part Zeus's um, sleeping around with other women and those stories that leads Socrates to sort of question whether we, need to, we should be telling these stories about the gods and goddesses. And so even the Greeks themselves start to sort of question the morality or at least the very least the actions and the repercussions of those actions for these um, Olympian deities. Lastly, I um, need, should also mention that we do know that Zeus also seeing um, the boy Ganymede takes him to Olympus to be the cupbearer um, of the gods. And we do see him in the Iliad and the Odyssey. And it, I should mention that um, you know, it's sort of unclear, sort of, so a lot of the versions it's Zeus like is in love with Ganymede. Um, it's really sort of like unclear what that relationship is supposed to represent. Um, and 
really that's not going to be for discussion here um, in mythology. But if you know if you, you'd like to have that discussion, we could um, have it via Zoom or something like that. If you're if you're sort of curious more about that. So as I've said, we have this hero Scamos, sacred marriage. Here we have Zeus and Hera. So if we remember what this is, the union between a sky god and a fertility goddess. And in large part, <coughs> Hera is, a lot of what we know about Hera is really wrapped up in her marriage with Zeus, which we're going to see with several of these female deities. Okay. Homer came 12, we have of Hera, I sing the golden throne whom Rhea born to be queen of the immortals of supreme beauty, sister and wife of Zeus, the loud booming glorious one whom all of the blessed ones on Mount Olympus revere and honor no less than Zeus, whose sport is the thunderbolt. So I, I didn't really mention that earlier, but in representations of Zeus, we often will see him holding a thunderbolt. He's always going to be bearded. Here again, the thunderbolt in this case, he's holding this staff, but bearded. Presumably, this is him holding a thunderbolt. You'll actually use this representation again because it's unclear if this is Poseidon or Zeus. Um, it could be a trident he was holding. We don't know what he was holding, um, but you know, this would be a pose for throwing the thunderbolt. Again, this, which is sort of supposed to represent what maybe the statue in the Temple of Olympia looked like. Um, we have bearded Zeus, of course, holding Nike here. The eagle is another thing. This is Zeus's bird. We see, we see that in representations of Zeus also. Here, on the other hand, we often see wearing this sort of crown holding this dish, which represents marriage. It's part of like marriage ceremonies. Sometimes she's holding, and often she's holding a staff also. Um, again, here we see her with Zeus. And here she is sitting. So once again, we have this representation of Hera with a staff and a crown. But Hera, whose Roman name is Juno, is of course queen of the gods. As the queen of, or I'm sorry, the goddess of, of marriage, she holds a certain amount of power over Zeus and takes part in the power that Zeus has. Where Zeus has this supreme power in the world and amongst the gods, Hera wields a lot of power within their marriage. We've seen the story of her taking the belt of seduction from Aphrodite. But it's not really clear that this is necessary. So with her power inside of the marriage and being the goddess of marriage self, she also chooses to have no consorts, no lovers who are not Zeus. Although, she is very jealous of Zeus's lovers. For instance, Io, who's a priestess of Hera, who Zeus wants to um, you know, be with, have relations with. This upsets Hera. And so, right? Um, 
Hera turns her into a cow. We have Simile, like I mentioned before, who is Dionysus' mother, who Hera tricks into getting Zeus to show her his, in her purest form, a lightning bolt, and it evaporates Simile. Of course, Alcmene and her son Heracles, who Hera tortures throughout his entire life. Similar to Zeus, similarly to Zeus, who produces Athena on his own, Hera does attempt to produce a god without Zeus. This is Hephaestus. In part, if you remember when I sort of talked about Hephaestus a little bit um, with Aphrodite, that Hephaestus is sort of has a gamp, he's sort of um, lame. And this sort of ties into the story with Hera, where Zeus produces Athena, who is almost a perfect goddess, especially in Zeus's eyes. When Hera attempts to do the same, she's incapable of producing something so perfect as Athena. Again, this gets at this idea of you know, Greeks concepts of um, gender equality um, and things of that nature, where clearly they favor men over women. And we'll actually see later um, in the semester that in large part for a long time, Greeks don't think women even are part of the sort of the genetic production of children. Again, we'll, we'll sort of get to that later um, in the semester. Hera has two epithets that are important, of course, ox-eyed, which means like big eyes, large eyes. Probably not meant to be, in some ways this is, um, and could be an insult, but I think in, for a, a Hera's sake, it really is sort of about how she's sort of like is all seen. White armed, of course, as a matron, she would stay with, sort of stay in the house. So having a tan would be a bad thing. Um, having those white arms sort of show her as this ideal uh, matron. Here we have the temple of Hera in Picenum, or Pis yeah, Piscinum in southern Italy. I haven't really mentioned this, and um, this isn't really pertinent to the course, but the Greeks do colonize in Italy, um, and they start to build temples in the Greek style. So th here is a, actually a Greek-style temple in modern-day um, Italy. And this is actually the most surviving, I mean, it's the I mean, most intact Greek temple um, in the Roman world. So we see, again, just like with the temple of Zeus in Athens, these different cities would set up temples to deities who weren't just their patrons. Um, we find these temples spread out through many of these um, Greek and Roman um, cities. So again, we see with these representations of Hera, and I'm really planning on sort of ending here with these representations. Again, we see Hera in the center here with her crown, staff, and this dish. Again, the representation on the side, we have the crown um, on Hera's head with this very distinct hairstyle. You notice the same in all three. And that sort of ties in. I mean, if we look back at these representations of Hera, you can see a little bit of her hair, but in these statues, we definitely see this very distinct hairstyle. And these are really more statues of Juno, of course. These are Roman statues here. But again, the symbols that we see inside of these representations are what help us identify them or help you know, anyone identify them. 
This is a fun little parlor trick you can play when you go to museums, if you like going to museums. Sort of memorizing the iconography of the Deities. And you don't have to look at the little plaque. You can be um, impress people. Right? Oh, well, that's, that's clearly a representation of Hera because um, you know, of this dish that she's holding that, that represents um, marriage and you know we have this crown of hers right so we <laughs> so like i said that's a fun little trick but um it's also good to be able to sort of spot these representations um, and recognize these iconographies all right so last little um is sort of in summary and just sort of the takeaway that i want you to get from this of course is we have this heroes gamos of Zeus and Hera. And while in many ways their marriage isn't perfect in the sense of the word in the sense of the word of a perfect marriage. Zeus is clearly unfaithful to Hera. It's can sort of call into question, well, what do we mean by this like sacred marriage or things like that? And so removing sort of the modern thoughts of marriage on, on this, this here's Gamos really is meant to represent the types of, of deities sort of involved in the marriage, the sky god, fertility sort of thing, fertility goddess. But also is really just there to represent these marriages between these deities, imperfect, imperfect as they are. But it is in fact these stories, particularly of Zeus and Hera, that Socrates later will call into question whether we should be teaching these myths to children, because they show particularly Zeus being very immoral in this in, in, in like thinking of this idea of sort of morals doing not being very kind not being very good the same with Hera right where she strikes vengeance against um, these women who Zeus has children with and doesn't take it out on Zeus is that the type of story we should be telling children? Socrates, like I said, calls this into question, not putting any sort of like modern moral implications on it, which I'm trying to avoid and I would like us all to try to avoid. And so we'll sort of see that in all of these stories, they're not ever telling us this sort of like fairy tale or stories like we see in fairy tales. We're looking at flawed deities just as much as we're gonna see flawed heroes later on down the road. And so with that, I think I'm gonna conclude. I hope you enjoyed this lecture um, as always. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to contact me and I will catch you next time.